Welcome to Becoming Catholic. My name is Nate. I am a Protestant youth pastor who has relatively recently experienced a conversion of the heart to the Catholic Church. So I'm very much still engaged in Protestant ministry. And if you're not familiar with my story, if this is your first time here, uh, there is a video in the info card. You can click and watch that to see kind of how I've got here. Um, there's a couple other videos that'll bring you up to speed to where we're at, but this channel is my journey toward Rome. This is my exploration of the Catholic faith and uh, my experience sort of catechizing myself and practicing Catholic devotional practices. Um, and I just want to share that with, with you because when I started this channel, it took off relatively quickly. People really liked it. And, you know, I just feel like if, if God is giving me a space to, to talk, if he's giving me a platform to share, uh, then I'm going to share what I'm learning and what I'm experiencing because I am convinced that the Catholic church is the one true church. And yeah, I'm so excited. So you've probably clicked on this video because you either saw the title, which says Becoming a Catechist, and you're interested in what it, how to become a catechist, or what it means to be a catechist, or you saw the picture, and the thumbnail, and said, how can a Protestant become a Catholic catechist? So I am here to share with you my experience and explain what's going on. So first and foremost, as I said, I am a Protestant youth pastor, currently employed full-time at a Protestant church, and yet I am taking the catechist formation class online through Aquinas College in Nashville. And uh, basically how that works is there are six courses. Each course is made up of five lessons. Each lesson is made up of two videos and one quiz, and uh, I have just uh, almost finished, I'll get to that, almost finished the first of those six courses. Um, and each course I finish, I'm gonna come here and share with you my experience. The reason I'm doing this is because I believe that this channel very well may become a sort of ministry, and an apostolate of catechizing people and sharing the, the Catholic faith and Catholic doctrine with Protestants and atheists and people of all walks of life and, and spiritual journeys. And so I'm just, I am so grateful and so blessed to be able to share my journey with, with anyone who watches these videos. And so in part, I just simply want to educate myself. I want to prepare myself. I want to equip myself to be able to do that well. And so I am taking this catechist formation class. The other thing is that you know, even though I eventually may leave uh, the Protestant church, I don't foresee myself never participating in ministry again. And I, th I love teaching. I love teaching doctrine and theology and church history. And I would really love to do that in a Catholic setting. And so again, I think even before converting or be, being received into uh, the Catholic Church, I kind of want to prepare myself. In my previous video, you also know that um, as a family unit, uh, my wife and I are not prepared or ready to start the process. Uh, so, but I am eager to, to learn and be catechized, and so this is my way of, of being catechized. Now, if you clicked on this because this came up in a Google search or a YouTube search because you are curious on how you can become a catechist, I'm not, I don't really have all the information. What I can tell you is that there are courses online, like the one I'm taking, that you do not need approval from your diocese to take. And uh, at the end of it, you will receive some sort of certificate. Uh, and, and that certificate basically says that you would make a good catechist. And at that point you would just, once you have that, you would talk to your priest or your bishop um, about becoming a catechist. And hopefully your congregation, your parish or another church in the area has a place for you to do that. Um, 
but I think that they, these are great courses to take even if you don't plan to be some sort of formal catechist because as Christians we are all called to share our love of Jesus and share our faith in Christ and share the gospel story and there is no better way to prepare yourself than to kind of come into a more full knowledge of what it is that we believe and what it is that we confess and so um, whether you're interested in becoming some sort of formal catechist within your diocese or you just want to know more about the Catholic faith I highly recommend taking a catechist formation class and after taking the first course of the the course I'm taking at Aquinas uh, College in Nashville I would recommend that course it's not expensive it's $25 per course and there are six courses so $150 total um, it they say each course takes about 10 to 12 hours it took me way less time than that it probably took me about six hours to do the first course um, so go check it out i will leave a link in the description to 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 that website go check out the aquinas college online catechist formation course okay so on to hopefully what you came here for um <laughs> if you came for what i just said i guess you could you could leave the video now but please don't because uh it would help me if you stayed. <laughs> um, so I took the first course. Um, the first course outlined uh, the I believe in God statement of the creed. Uh, it covered the sacraments and more specifically the sacrament of baptism. It covered our dignity as humans, which is found in our creation and the fact that we were made in God's image. Um, and it also covered some things that had to do with church authority and magisterium. And um, it was really awesome. So it was a more spiritual experience than I expected it to be. Um, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like awfully sensational. But there was a little bit of uh, sensation or spiritual stirring. When I first started the course, my spirit just felt stirred. I had a really strong sensation of expectation. Um, and it lasted probably halfway through the entire course and it dwindled as it went but this my spirit was just anticipating truth is how it felt um, it was like my spirit knew that I was about to receive a big deposit of truth and it was just so excited and that was a really cool feeling and like I said it, it dwindled as those types of things do uh, but just a, a really awesome way to start the course. And I really did enjoy the first couple lessons more than I did the last couple. And so that may have been part of it too, is just it was a topic I was more interested in than the topics that were to come. Uh, but but that was kind of the, the sensation that I felt just as I began taking the course. And like I said, I didn't expect anything like that. I kind of expected to be bored and it was gonna take a lot of discipline for me to not like cheat or or like just kind of not pay attention or, you know, I just, I'm not a good student. And so I anticipated that I would just, again, not be a good student. I wouldn't be very disciplined. And I think my spirit having that sensation made me naturally more disciplined because I was just so excited to be taking this course. Uh, the other note I took, which I think is probably it's probably something that, even if they aren't able to articulate it, it's probably something that most uh, Catholic converts from Protestantism feel. Um, and that's that since having this conversion of the heart, the, the Catholic faith, the Catholic doctrines seem so sensical to me. All of it seems like it makes sense. But yet I am not able to make sense of it. And as I was taking the course, especially the, just the very first lesson video, I just had this strong sense that, oh my goodness, the Catholic faith, which just kind of in theory was sensical to me, now makes sense to me. Um, I, you know, it, I knew it was sensical and now it makes sense. And so, like I said, probably most Protestants who are in the RICA uh, program or who are taking courses like this or are just studying the catechism, um, they probably all feel that way. Um, I, I'm just so grateful to be able to articulate that because it's just such a beautiful revelation that, oh my goodness, like 
there's a reason my heart feels drawn towards the Catholic Church. Um, and it's in big part because it's sensical. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I now understand all the sense that it makes. So that was that was really cool. So those are two of the two like big notes that I took away, but um, at least personal notes, what was happening internally. But I did bullet a, a bunch of a bunch of things. I have just like some notes that I just want to go over because these are just like things that I learned, and this is these are sort of the things that made the sensical faith make sense to me. Um, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights of this course, and then there's something really cool at the end of the video. So if you made it this far, stick around at the end of the video because there's one really cool thing that I'm gonna share with you. Um, so the first thing that uh, the the instructor mentioned was the difference between fides quae creditur and fides qua creditur, and that's Latin. I do not recall the exact translation of that. But the fides quae creditor is essentially faith as a noun. So uh, faith is described in two parts as a noun, which is basically God's revelation of truth. So faith isn't just simply an emotion, but it's, it's in part the truth that is revealed to us, the truth that we believe. Um, it is objective truth. It is God's truth. And so that's the, the fides quae creditor. And then the fides qua creditor is faith as a verb. And so that's our response to God's revelation. And I just love this explanation because I feel like as a Protestant, faith isn't really explained. It, it, faith is pretty much just you believe it. And even though you can't see it, you believe it because blessed is the one who can't see it and believes it. And that's all we get in the Protestant church. And that's not to say that the, the really well-respected Protestant uh, leaders in church history like John Wesley or Martin Luther didn't didn't explore the definition of faith um, and, and explain it more clearly. But being in the Protestant church for a very long time and having participated and been a part of various denominations and movements, I've never really had faith explained that well. And so that really stuck out to me. And this is, this is the thing, this very thing is the thing that, I, this, is, this is when I took the note the sensical Catholic faith makes sense to me. This is what made sense to me. The explanation of the Catholic fetus qua creditor or the Catholic uh, response, faith response to God's truth, to God's revelation is fourfold. It is the creed. That is what we believe. So we kind of declare what we believe, um, which is kind of a summary of that fetus, fetus qua, uh, God's revelation of truth. Then there are the sacraments, which is how we worship. We worship God through the sacraments and we receive his grace and participate in his grace through the sacraments. Then there is morality or the moral life, which is how we live. Kind of, you know, the sacraments are these moments, these ceremonies where we come in contact with Christ. But our moral life is just kind of our daily moment to moment way we live, which has been changed because of our faith. And then finally, prayer, which is communication between God and myself. And so that is sort of the fourfold uh, response of faith. That's what it means to respond to God's revelation. And I, I think this also encapsulates what has been so frustrating for me in the Protestant church is that I don't get to participate in the sacraments. Very rarely do I actually participate in reciting the creed. And I'm basically expected to just live a moral life and just have prayer. But it's really hard to do those things if you don't have the sacraments, uh, which bring you in regular contact with God's grace in a way that's manifested so much differently than it is in prayer and through just reading scripture. And the creed, which is just, you know, it's so nice to regularly recite, confess out loud, and also remind yourself of what you believe. Uh, so I, that's, that really just grabbed a hold of me right in the first video. Some other things that stood out is faith is an act of the intellect and the will, not an emotion. Now, again, if you watch that very first video I posted on this channel, I got a lot of comments that because I had said I have been convinced intellectually of Catholicism, but I haven't had any sort of spiritual experience to 
to back that up. And coming from a very charismatic background, um, I really wanted and needed that spiritual, uh, that spiritual, sensational, sentimental uh, feeling or experience. And I just love that uh, Sister Mary Michael, she, the, she's the, uh, the instructor of this course, she just said, faith is an act of the intellect and the will. It is not an emotion. And then it clicked like, oh, this is why I just feel fully converted in the heart at this point is because I didn't really need a spiritual experience. I have had wonderful feelings and experiences and sensations since this conversion of the heart and since uh, practicing some Catholic devotions, but those things weren't necessary. Once I was convic convinced of the intellect, that was the first half, and then the will is just my effort, and that's the second half of my response. So um, I really love that. Then she got into the magisterium and church authority, and what is so cool is she said the magisterium is the living teaching office of the church and is the authentic interpreter of sacred scripture and sacred tradition. It guards the deposit of faith, and that that's that faith is a noun um, is what it guards. This is one of the the things that drew me in kind of early towards Catholicism. Before I was convinced of the Marian dogmas, before I was convinced uh, of the papacy, before I was convinced uh, of any of those things, what I was convinced of the very first thing was I can't read scripture plainly and come to the right conclusions. The reason I can't do that is because I am a 21st century American and the people who wrote the scriptures were like second temple Jews who had converted to Christianity and who were being persecuted and martyred for believing in Jesus. And I just, I, I have no uh, understanding of the Old Testament um, by comparison to the people who wrote scripture. And so there must be an objective way of knowing uh, the truth. There, because truth is objective, because what the scripture teaches is objective, there, it, there has to be someone who knows that objective truth. And it, it certainly couldn't be Martin Luther, because just by comparison, uh, if I'm going to believe what someone writes about scripture, how they interpret scripture, and I can choose between Martin Luther, who is 1500 years after the apostles, or St. Polycarp, who is literally discipled by the Apostle John, I'm going to listen to St. Polycarp. And if St. Polycarp doesn't answer my questions, I'm going to go to St. Irenaeus, who is discipled by Polycarp, who is discipled by the Apostle John. And so the idea that you kind of you kind of track that and you realize all the things that those very early guys said, it sounds very Catholic. Um, and it doesn't look the same because... While God has given us truth, uh, we sort of develop our understanding over time. And so as you go through church history and you get to the 300 AD and the 400 AD, things start making more and more sense and there's more categories and there's greater understanding and new words to explain things. Um, but it just makes sense that the Catholic Church has that because they've always been the ones that have had that. Um, and as a Protestant, you're kind of taught that, like, the church started with Paul and Peter and John, and almost immediately after that, it got kind of weird, and it didn't really get fixed until the 1500s. But if you come from my background, that was only the start of it, because it really didn't take off until the 1700s when John Wesley comes into the picture. Um, well, I do still love John Wesley, uh, he wasn't Catholic, so um, yeah. so. Just this, this idea that, that the church and the magisterium has the authentic interpretation of scripture and tradition. Um, I just love that. And I feel so comfortable. I am tired as a Protestant. I'm tired of trying to figure out what things mean and change my convictions accordingly. Um, I'm kind of at a point where I think that my faith is supposed to be more simple than that. I think there is an objective truth. It is knowable. And so I just want to know it so that I can be obedient to it. When we got to the sacraments lesson, the sacraments give us what they signify. I just love that idea, right? That like baptism signifies your death with Christ and your resurrection. Um, it, 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 it signifies your birth, your spiritual rebirth. 
and and I just I love that. And w what's so cool too is uh, she said that the sacraments, all of the sacraments, bring us into actual contact with the historical event of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So if you think about like communion or or the Eucharist by receiving the Eucharist, you come into actual contact with the crucified body of Christ. When you are baptized, you share in Christ's death and in his resurrection. That like, when, when you confess your sin, you are, to, in confession, you are claiming the cross of Christ over your life and over your, your spiritual life. And so uh, this, it, this is why the sacraments are so important. You know, it's not simply that, well, you know, there are a bunch of ceremonies and they're helpful for reminding us. But no, they spiritually, like, they really actually give you something that you cannot get otherwise. And I love the idea that it's almost like a time machine. Receiving the Eucharist is like a time machine where you come in contact with the crucified body of Christ. What was also cool is in the church administering the sacraments or the priests administering the sacraments um, they're not actually the ones administering it Christ is the one who administers all of the sacraments Christ is the one who administers the Eucharist because it's his body he is the one that administers baptism because the the priest who 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 baptizes is standing in the position in the power in the authority of Christ when he does so when priests get ordained by those above them in leadership. It is Christ in those positions of leadership that is ordaining that priest. When a couple gets married, it is Christ marrying those people. And the church, the priests, they step into the role of Christ because Christ does all of those things through his body. Again, it makes me feel so comfortable because in Protestant church, I am not told that Christ is present in the pulpit. I am only told that the Holy Spirit is sort of floating around the room and just kind of like touching people's hearts and giving people goosebumps at certain moments during the sermon. But the idea that the, the person who is delivering the sermon or the homily, the person who is speaking the word of God to me is in a sense, Jesus. And the person praying for me is Jesus. When I go into the confessional, the person I'm confessing my sin to is Jesus. And so when the, when the priest says you are forgiven, it is Jesus who says you are forgiven. And so the idea that Christ administers the sacraments through his body. Our humanity was wounded by sin, but not completely corrupted. Partially, I just like that because I am kind of like an anti-Calvinist, even I always have been as a Protestant. And so I just, Calvinists are into total depravity, the idea that we are just totally depraved, totally incapable of goodness uh, outside of God's Holy Spirit. And I just love that. No, actually, our humanity was wounded. It wasn't completely corrupted. And what baptism does is it, it essentially takes the person who was once inclined to sin, and it gives them the freedom to be inclined to goodness and obedience to God. Um, and through baptism, our soul is marked with the seal of the Lord, and we enter the priesthood. You know, all Christians, and, and more specifically, all Catholics, but, but all Christians, when we are baptized, we enter the, the common priesthood. And, you know, we are priests, in a sense, unto ourselves, right? I, I offer up sacrifice on behalf of myself. Um, we are also priests unto our families, and we are priests unto the world. Thank you, Richard, for that. Um, but we are, we are priests unto the world, unto our families, and unto ourselves. Um, and you think of it as kind of the Levitical priests, the Old Testament priests. They were priests unto the nation of Israel. And so they would offer sacrifices on behalf of Israel. And just like the Catholic priest offers the sacrifice of the Mass on behalf of his parish, he emulates that Levitical priest, but in the common priesthood, I emulate the Levitical priest just in my own internal spiritual life and on behalf of my, my family. As the husband and the father, I am the priest of my, my wife and child. My wife is a priest of, of our child. And, and as a household, we are a house of priests unto the world who does not yet know Christ. And 
just it's I love this idea because the only people who were allowed to enter the holy of holies in the Levitical in the Levitical law were the priests. And so we they were really the only ones who were capable of worshiping God. And so when when a person is baptized, they become a priest, which means they are given the freedom and the right and the authority to worship Jesus. And that's, I just love that idea. You can't worship Jesus if you aren't first made a priest. And so by becoming a baptized Christian, you enter the common priesthood, which enables you to worship Jesus internally, as well as with, uh, with the church body. And so I just, I think that that's such a cool idea. I've never considered that. The only reason I'm able to, to worship Jesus is because I'm baptized. Um, the other thing I thought was cool, and I've kind of heard this a couple of times because I read a few books on the sign of the cross, but you can renew your baptismal vow by using holy water and invoking the Trinity with the sign of the cross. And uh, because the sign of the cross is made over you at baptism, and because holy water is used at baptism, and the Trinity is invoked at baptism, every time you do that, you are not just simply blessing yourself before entering the sanctuary you are renewing your baptismal vow and kind of refreshing it as a sacramental um, as you go as you go before the Lord and receive him in Mass. This is something else that's cool about baptism. And I actually don't know that it's really all about baptism, but I did love this thought. It came up in the, in the baptism video. Mary was redeemed by Christ at the moment of her conception. That's just a, you know, Marian dogma. If you're Catholic, you believe that. Um, and therefore... She needed no baptism, which sounds like kind of weird, I guess, especially as a Protestant. I'm like, well, I thought everybody needs to be baptized. But what's so cool is she is the role model of all those who are baptized because she represents what happens at baptism. Mary was at her conception, was given the freedom to be inclined to goodness and obedience. And she was throughout her whole life, God maintained that in her um and so by virtue of the life she lived and the grace god gave her she is the role model for those of us who are baptized what happens at baptism we are we are given the freedom to be like mary in that sense um and also be like christ but but i just love that imagery of mary um you know as a protestant you know coming into catholicism Mary is a big focal point, a big issue for a lot of people, and she hasn't been much of an issue for me. And, and so I just kind of, every time I learn something about her and what she means and what she represents and who she actually is, I'm just in awe of, of these things that, that feel so true. And I'm so grateful that I'm finally getting to learn them. The moral life is the life God has called us to live. And man has a moral life, but animals do not. So God has called man to live a moral life. That's kind of what he was created for. And what was wild to me was that the Catholic Church has a, a, a stance on whether or not animals go to heaven. And it's that they don't, which I don't like <laughs> because I've always believed that they do. My wife doesn't believe that they go to heaven. She never did. And so that'll be easier for her, I think. Uh, I don't like that idea. <laughs> I've always said to people who ask me that question, well, the Bible says, who knows? So I just like to think that they do. Um, but uh, it, it does make sense because animals, I, anyone who's ever said animals don't go to heaven in the Protestant church only ever says, well, they have no soul. Okay, but who says they have no soul? You know, scripture says that there will be animals in heaven. Why wouldn't they be the ones that are here? That's always been my argument. And the people who argue against that just simply say God made man different than he made animals. But they couldn't explain what that was specifically. And, and the difference is that man was given and is called to a moral life. Animals don't have morality. They act on instinct and desire. And they have no ability to control those things. And so that's just, I just found that fascinating. And I do love the separation of humanity from animals. I don't like when when humanity is called animalistic or called an animal. Um, and so I did appreciate that separation, even though I am sad to know that all of my pets are gone forever. Man's dignity is rooted in creation, which I guess I, I understood without being able to articulate it that way. Um, but, but yes, our dignity is 
rooted in creation because we were made in God's image. And this, this was cool. This was towards the end of the course. I started to get bored. It was harder to pay attention, but this stood out to me a lot. And that's that man is the bridge. Humanity is the bridge between the material realm and the spiritual realm. And that's because man is, is material. He is body. He is matter. And he is also spirit. He has a soul. And so as humans, we, we are the bridge, even though, you know, Adam and Eve were kind of the whole reason there's a need for a bridge, <laughs> but it, in that we still are a bridge between the material realm and the spiritual realm. We have matter and we have soul. And, and so that's just a, I love that idea that like, yes, my dignity is in the fact that I was made in the image of God, but God made me a bridge between between the world he has put me in and the world that he is in, so to speak. Um, I just think that that's a really beautiful image. And as Christians, that bridge has been restored. You know, for non-Christians, that bridge is kind of broken down. You can't, you can't cross that bridge. Uh, but for Christians, we, we, we are the restored bridge. The bridge has been fixed. And so our job is to kind of tell other people, hey, come walk across this bridge. Like, come come understand what the path that you can walk down, the life that you are free to live if you would just accept it. Um, finally, the last note I have is we become less human when we sin because God created humanity to be sinless and perfect, which I love, you know, and I've heard um, lots of people say, say things of this nature, but it always stands out to me every time someone says it. And that's that when someone sins or they do something bad, you know, they gossip, they cuss, they're rude, whatever, and they and then their their excuse is, well, I'm only human. But th that very statement is is inaccurate. It's theologically incorrect. You did not sin because you are only human. You sinned because you are in a fallen state. But but human, humanity, like you were made to live a complete, perfect whole and holy moral life in union with God. And every time we sin, it goes against our humanity. Every time we sin, it dehumanizes us. It separates us from the fact that we are human. Um, and so even just kind of processing that just now, thinking, you know, those who do not know Christ, those who whose uh, bridge hasn't been restored, who are living very immoral, sinful lives, they they are like animals because they have been dehumanized in their sin and and so by co-laboring with God's holy spirit Christ's work on the cross and the church his body we are restored and rehumanized if you will um and that's really what the christian life is all about is to be rehumanized um rediscover and step into what god created you for and so now that the last note has been covered, that's all the stuff that stood out to me in Course 1. And if you don't believe any of that stuff, you can go ahead and you know say so in the comments. I probably will argue with you for all of like two responses because I enjoy uh, arguing and debating. Um, but I'm not going to make videos about each of these topics and go in-depth to explain all of these. If you believe it, praise God. If you don't, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> But there is one thing, one last thing I want to do for this video, and that's that I said at the beginning, I have not officially completed this course. There is one assignment left. The assignment is to write a 300 to 400 word response to the following question. What does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God, and what is the significance of this dignity with regards to the moral life and prayer and the sacrament of baptism. And I have not answered that question. And the reason I haven't answered that question is because instead of sitting down in front of my computer and just kind of typing and thinking and meditating, I'm a verbal processor. I'm gonna verbally process this question in front of the camera and share it with you. Um, and once I am done, I will submit my answer. I will 
once I have kind of formulated my thoughts a little bit, I will sit at my computer and type the response. So before Aquinas College gets to, to read my response to this question, you get to hear my response to this question. So what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? Well, you know, based on what I've learned in this course and also just what I know as a Christian, I, I believe that God has uniquely made man in his image, meaning that we resemble his goodness, his love, his authority, his holiness, his beauty, his majesty. We, we resemble him more than anything else. Uh, we are, in a sense, God's self-portrait. Um, what I've taught often is that, you know, we are God's self-portrait. And when Adam and Eve uh, committed that first sin, they basically took the portrait and crumpled it up and maybe tore a couple pieces off of it and then unfolded it. And it was still a portrait of God. It just wasn't a perfect portrait anymore it was damaged um but that's what it means to be made in his image it's it's to resemble him the same way a son resembles his father um and all of god's qualities and characteristics we we resemble him uh spiritually and physically i believe i, be, I believe that in all senses of the word we are we resemble the lord that makes us beautiful and significant and it means that if you have anything nasty or negative to say about anybody Christian or not uh, you are not simply sinning against that person you are sinning against the image of the Lord um, and that's pretty wild you know when a when a son is insulted or bullied uh, his father gets angry and steps in often calls the school or calls the bully's parents, um, he steps in because that is his son. And this son of mine bears my image. Um, that's what it means to, to be created in his image and in his likeness. Um, what is the significance of this dignity in regards to the moral life, prayer, and the sacrament of baptism? Well, I think I'll work my way backwards. It starts with baptism because baptism is, the, is that first sacrament that basically restores your your inclination um, it restores what you are made to be it kind of sets you up on the path that you're supposed to walk down when God created us he created us to live a certain life and baptism is the sacrament that sets us up and prepares us to live that life we are given the Holy Spirit at baptism and so when you are baptized you are given God's Spirit and set on the right path and God basically says go that way you no longer walk down that road you'd walk down that road and so that's what baptism does it kind of restores our dignity right it takes that painting or that self-portrait of God and it irons it out and and it it fuses the paper back together where it was torn and it just it just makes the picture better and it makes it it restores it and it's more glorious than it was even before it was it was destroyed or even before it was wounded um, that's what baptism does and, and because baptism sets you up to live that life that life that you live is a life of morality you live a moral life in response to God's grace to you you live a good obedient moral life the life which he called you to live at the very beginning anyway and in union with that you also live a life of prayer. You communicate with God and you listen to him as he communicates with you. And so baptism sets us up. It prepares the way for us to live the life God called us to live and have the, you know, the interpersonal relationship with God that we are supposed to have. It restores, these three things restore what was initially broken at, by Adam and Eve. And so that, that is, that is the significance of that dignity as it relates to those three things, those three topics. So that's my response. I don't know how many words that was, but I will have to make it 300 to 400 words and then type it out. But uh, thank you. I know this video was long 
and probably boring at parts, but thank you for sitting down and watching it if you made it this far. Please subscribe to the channel. Please hit the bell icon. Your support helps this channel grow. Um, share, share these videos with your priests and the catechists in your church. Share these videos with your friends, especially if you're a Catholic and you have friends who are Protestant, um, who may or may not be considering Catholicism. Share these videos. But the more people who watch these videos, the more people who subscribe, um, the better it is for me. And it kind of makes room for myself and my family to explore Catholicism in a deeper way than we are yet able to do. So um, by subscribing to this channel, you're not just simply, you know, giving me a couple of dollars, uh, but by subscribing to this channel, you, you are blessing me with the freedom to explore these truths, which I'm discovering more fully. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you're blessed by it. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Be blessed.